going to go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so you guys can follow along. And if you'd like to take notes, feel free. Although I can also uh, send out a copy of this, uh, this PowerPoint program to you if you'd like. Just to tell you a little bit about myself, I have been in Toastmasters for about 13 years now. I've been a member of seven different clubs over that time. I'm currently a member of three clubs and I founded one of them and have played just about every officer role one can play inside of a club. Plus, I've been a club mentor, a club sponsor, and a club coach, and the club coach chair. I've been an area director. I've been a division director. So I've spent a lot of time in leadership roles with Toastmasters, which is a perfect fit for my field because I am a professional trainer as well, a corporate trainer, and working with mostly with teams on leadership issues and team building. So I wanted to teach you guys today some of the top five leadership tricks, although I don't know if I'd call it a trick, but you, you're actually going to be utilizing techniques to get results from people that work magically. So in like magic, people might say, well, if you change your style to get results from other people, isn't that manipulating them? And I do agree, it is manipulation, but it's ethical manipulation. I would never do anything except give people what they want to get what I want. And so I'm going to teach you the five major traits of great leaders and five techniques in those that can help you magically create results when you're leading other people. Now, for our guests, you guys may be aware that Toastmasters often is presented as an opportunity to build your, your speaking skills but actually, it's not just that. What we're really all about is not just helping you be a better communicator, but helping you communicate for a purpose. And the primary purpose we teach you to communicate for is how to lead others in the direction that you would like them to go. Like who here has ever wanted someone to go in your direction? Such as you have an idea that you want people to follow and you have to present it in such a way where people are willing to do so. So this is all about leadership and the ability to get people to follow you. So I want you guys to feel comfortable asking questions. So feel free at any point to interrupt if you'd like, or if you want, you can put in the chat box what your question is. And then at the end, we'll answer these questions, but it can, you can just type them in there at any time as we go along. And then at the end, we'll have about five, 10 minutes for questions as well. So the five tips for great leaders, these tricks that I wanna teach you guys, is based on a very famous book that came out. Uh, this was, came out about 30 years ago, and this is a book that's called The Leadership Challenge. You see that here on the slide here. The Leadership Challenge was a program that certain uh, doctoral students had created to try to find out of all the leadership traits that are out there, what are the top ones that every leader that is great has in common? And they narrowed it down to about 125 traits, boiled that down into what are the 25 most basic things that every of these leaders are doing. And then could we put them into five categories to simplify it? And what they came up with is that great leaders follow five practices. Now that doesn't mean you are an expert in all of these, but you wanna work on these to the best of your ability over time. You'll see this in Toastmasters, you'll see this in your workplace, You'd see this with your bosses, as well as you wanna practice it yourself because we are all leaders in one way or another. So the five practices that I'll address, number one, to model the way for others, set the tone for how you want other people to be. Number two, inspire people with a vision that gets them excited and makes them want to follow you. If you can get them to think that that's their vision that they get excited about, it's very easy to get people to come along with you. The third part is one of the most difficult for many of us, and that is in challenging the process. Because once we figure out what works, what do we typically want to do? We want to keep doing it. How long do you keep doing something that is working in a world that is always changing? Well, generally, we'll do it until it stops working. And that generally leads us to crisis. So a great leader sees change coming and is willing to challenge the process and get people to follow them through this change to be successful. 
The fourth major leadership practice that we'll focus on is to enable others to act. That's one of my favorites, because if you can empower people to come up with their own solution on how to get the results you want them to get, are they more committed? Can you hold them more accountable when it's their plan? I know that we have some people on here who are parents. Terry, you probably would think that as a parent, your job is to tell your kids what to do. Actually, even your young daughter in your lap, you could let her choose what she, what, what she might want to do or how she would do something you want. If you wanted her to clean her room. Well, if you could work with her on coming up with a plan and she came up with a plan. Now, of course, being at her age, you might want to guide her towards what might be the best plan for both of you. But if you encourage her to come up with her own plan, would she be more willing to do it that way? And so that's a, one of the keys is enabling others to act, empowering them. And then number five, encouraging the heart. That's the one I probably have the most difficulty with. This is in recognizing people and making them feel valued, making them feel important. Now, when I teach emotional intelligence, I always teach people, you can't make anyone feel anything. They can feel something, but I can't make them mad. They got mad. I can't hurt their feelings. They felt hurt. So I actually have no control over it, although I can, I can trigger some emotions by certain actions and certain things I say that can create that response for people. So as a leader, if I can encourage people by letting them know how much I value what they're doing, they're more willing to put more work into it, more effort into it. So these are the top five leadership practices that all the great leaders have followed. So let's look at these one by one. We'll start with modeling the way. As Toastmasters, we all are about setting the tone or setting the, the pace for what we want our team members, our, our fellow Toastmasters to do. And in Toastmasters itself, the entire program is centered around our core values, what we all value as Toastmasters. And so the four count core values we follow as Toastmasters is integrity, keeping your word, respect of others, even though they may not be like you, can you respect their way? Being of service to others and doing our very best, excellence. Now, I know that's sometimes hard to remember this, I-R-S-E, so I like switching it around a little bit to make it easier to remember. So imagine if you thought of it as we rise to excellence in Toastmasters. The R in rise is respect everyone in your club. It's mutual respect as they should respect us as well. Demonstrate integrity by always be willing to keep your word, or if you notice you're out of tune with what you promised, be willing to notice that, own it, and fix it. We always are here to be of service to others and help them to grow and be the best and help them achieve the best that they can be. And that best centers upon excellence. We want to not be perfect, but we want to give excellence, the best we can be. So let's look at what this means to us as Toastmasters, because when you guys join Toastmasters, and I know that some of you are just guests at this point, but I'm hoping that after today, you'll be considering that next step of joining. And when you join Toastmasters, before you sign on the dotted line that, yes, I'm willing to do this, you have to think about what have you said you'd be willing to do? Well, there is a Toastmasters promise that's written just above that signature line of what you're promising to offer everyone in this program, the people in your club, and what you're willing to do to learn. One of those things that we promise is to provide our fellow members with helpful, constructive evaluations. We give feedback because sometimes we don't see ourselves so clearly. It's what other people see that's usually a lot more clear than what we see. So giving someone feedback is a great way to help them to grow. But it has to sound helpful and constructive and positive. It has to be motivating because wouldn't you agree, it's difficult sometimes to hear people tell you what you did wrong and encourage you to change that. Well, in Toastmasters, we find a way to do that that is always positive. Even if I talk about something that you did as a mistake, I'm going to try to put it in the most positive way possible to make you feel good about your efforts and encourage you to take the advice. Secondly, we are here to help our clubs 
maintain positive and friendly environments to help our leaders grow and learn. And whose job is it? It's not just the president's. It's just not the vice president of membership and the vice president of education. It's everyone in the club. Even if you're not an officer, your job is to always be friendly, engaging, warm, helpful, and encouraging. Another thing we promise in Toastmasters is to serve as an officer when we're called upon to do so. You may even think to yourself, well, I don't know how to be an officer. Well, we will teach you how to. And you don't have to do it perfectly. You just do the best that you can and you learn from it because Toastmasters is where leaders are made. We teach you how to become a leader. It's just a safe place to practice these skills. And being a club officer is one of the best ways to learn all the important skills of a leader. Another thing that we promise in Toastmasters is to treat each other and our guests with respect and courtesy. You can disagree with someone, but always with respect, because how they come up with their ideas and their beliefs are just as right as how you came up with yours. They may be very different, but they are just as viable. They are just as valid. So your ability to treat each other with respect and courtesy is a great skill to learn. And imagine if we all do this in our lives, everywhere in our lives, how much better would we get along with each other? That's what we try to work on in Toastmasters. We want to master these skills. So let's look at this first tip or trick, as I called it, that can help you become a more effective leader. As I mentioned earlier, we are not always our best at noticing our own behavior. Other people sometimes notice this much better than we do. So one of the things you want to do is that you're going to become a more effective leader is you've got to notice those areas where you are not at your best. And sometimes others notice it better than you do. So listening to that feedback, all of our feedback that we offer to you is to help you to notice something that either worked or didn't work for us. Like if you're a speaker, Chris, and you're speaking to us, whose job is it to make sure that the way you do it makes us be willing to listen to you and follow where you're going? Is it our responsibility or is it yours? So do you notice where you did that well? And even more importantly, where you might want to work on making it better or more effective. So the first step is you've got to notice it. The second step, just like looking in that mirror, is that we've got to own it. We've got to be willing to own the fact that it is, if, they, if that's what they heard, that's how we came across. We might be thinking to ourselves, well, that wasn't my intention. I didn't mean for you to, to hit you like that or to come across like that to you. And yet that's how our communication came across. Like, have you ever had a communication with someone and you might have made them angry or hurt their feelings? Even though I said you can't do that, you can trigger that in them and not even know it. Well, whose fault is it if they got angry? Of course, it's their fault they got angry, but we may have said something that might have initiated that reaction. And we have to own our part in this miscommunication. So noticing it is the first step, owning our choices, what we chose to do, what we chose to say is our responsibility. So notice it, own it. And I don't wanna beat someone up when they make a mistake. All I want them to do is to fix it. Now, most people, when they make mistakes, they tend to want to blame other people in situations. But keep in mind that who's responsible for the choices that we make? It is us. And if we're responsible, we have to at least own that part of it. So the last step is to fix it. Come up with a new way, a different way to do it. So in Toastmasters, we're all about becoming great leaders and helping people to notice what they're doing that's not working for them, as well as the things that do work. But also, we want them to own the fact that it is what they chose to do or say that created that outcome. And all we want them to do is to come up with a better way to try it, come up with a way to fix it. So the first trick that's going to help you be more effective is notice it, own it, and fix it. Even when you make a mistake in communication, let's say you communicate to someone and you didn't mean to, to communicate it that way. 
They got their feelings hurt. Always be the first person to be willing to apologize. Now, of course, here in this case, my dog, actually, that was his drink, but my drink was the one in the front. But it just looks like he's apologizing. You've got to be able to forgive that kind of look. You know, he's just, he's just looks so sweet. But always be willing to apologize and on the other side, be willing to forgive somebody for a mistake. But if you're the one who had said the thing that created the problem, always be the first to be able to say, there seems to have been a miscommunication here. And if so, I do apologize for not being clear. Notice how now the other person is more encouraged to follow and clear up this situation. So you don't make them wrong. You actually want to do the opposite of that. So, but always be the first one to apologize. Even in Toastmasters, we have programs that analyze how well we are doing as a club. Like, do we make a great first impression with our members? Did we promise to do that? Yes. Do we orient our members well so they understand the program and how to do it? Do we offer fellowship and variety? Do we plan our programs with a good agenda and follow that agenda and keep within our time and you know, stay within the meeting uh, in an organized way? Do we have a membership strength that is strong where we have a, enough people here to fill the roles in our meetings? And do we recognize achievements of our members? Well, we actually have a program called the Moments of Truth that analyzes all six of those to give our clubs feedback on how well we're doing. And it's not to make our clubs wrong when we're not doing this to the best of our ability. It's just a matter of teaching them how they can be better at noticing it, owning it, and fixing it. So that's the key here to this first tip. So uh, any questions at this point uh, about this, this particular leadership trick? Great. Well, if you have any questions, just write it down in our chat room if you'd like, and we'll move on. But to summarize, a great leader always models the way. They set the example for excellence. You do what you say you're going to do. And and if there are times when you miss the mark, even if it's someone else who has to point that out for you, be willing to notice that, own it, and always apologize for your mistakes, and then take action that's going to fix it. So notice it, own it, and fix it is the first step that's going to help you be tremendously successful at getting people to follow you. The second area of a great leader is you want to make sure that you have a vision that excites you, that makes you want to go for it, makes you want to work for it. We all know that the vision for Toastmasters is to help us be, become excellent communicators and better leaders so that we're going to be more successful in our lives. How many of us would join Toastmasters because that's what we want? We are inspired by that vision. We're willing to put the work in, take the time to come to meetings, and write speeches and deliver speeches and get feedback because we know it'll help us to grow. And so if you can inspire others with your vision, you can get them to follow you. In Toastmasters, we have a particular club vision. And I love this club vision because it really says a lot about who we are as Toastmasters. And in Toastmasters, our mission for our individual clubs is we provide a supportive and positive learning experience in which members are empowered to develop communication and leadership skills, resulting in greater self-confidence and personal growth. That can excite almost anyone when you say, not only do we want this for ourselves, but we're here to support others and doing the same thing. Always being supportive, always being positive, always thinking of this being a learning experience. So even if you fail, it's all about failing forward. So you're failing up, you're growing, you're learning from the experience, which is the most powerful experience you learn from in life. It only comes from when you actually fail. When you do it perfectly, you don't really learn a lot from it. But when it doesn't work, you learn a lot. And we empower people to do it their own way, at their own time. And we're here to help them develop communication and leadership skills, which then as you do this, you will build greater self-confidence and grow personally as well as professionally. So you can see just from our club mission, 
It is meant to inspire everyone who joins Toastmasters, that we want this for everybody. And if you can achieve this, how much more effective will you be in getting what you want in your life? So we have that. And I want to teach you then what it is to be able to do that effectively, to inspire people with the mission. Well, first of all, in Toastmasters or anywhere else in life, you have a goal that you want to set and you create a success plan to achieve that goal or that mission. The plan is something you actually write down on paper, because if it's just up here, it's not a very good plan. It's hard for someone else to hold you accountable for your plan if you don't write it down. So you write down a plan for success, what you're going to do exactly, when you're going to do it, who you're going to work with, how you're going to get there, and when do you plan to have this done. That way, you can more easily hold yourself accountable, as well as it makes it easier for a support partner to hold you accountable for being successful. It's important to keep in mind that anyone who has a success plan, if you're supporting them, remind them why it matters. That's the whole reason why we're doing this, why we're inspired is because it matters in our lives. It matters to be able to get people to follow us. It matters to want to support others, to want to achieve, to want to succeed. And lastly, build and maintain enthusiasm. Create ways to keep your enthusiasm high. That's why having people who can cheer you on when you make certain levels of success, okay, you achieved this. You're not quite where you were going to end up, but you've gotten through to here. Celebrate that and then celebrate this level and celebrate that level so that you can reach the top. We've got to keep in mind you do it in small steps, but keep, in, keep maintaining that enthusiasm as you go. And generally, that's our job is to support others as they do their work as well. So inspire people with what we're going for, our mission. So another thing that is very important in terms of leadership development is having integrity and accountability. This is really what uh, it was all about with modeling the way is do you have integrity and accountability for doing what you say you're gonna do? Well, when you inspire people with a shared vision, you set a course for success, saying, this is the goal I'm going for, and these are the steps that it's going to take for me to get there. And if we're doing this as a team, you want to sell them on the benefits of achieving each of these goals. What's in it for us? How is this going to help us and benefit us in our lives? Because when people can clearly see the benefits, they can also see why they would make the time to do it. So sometimes it's hard to see the benefits in something because of how difficult you may be having a difficult time of it. And your team member's job is to remind you, to support you as you keep moving through these goals, to maintain that enthusiasm and keep building it as you go. So as long as we build and maintain enthusiasm around that vision that we're going for, it makes it almost sure thing that we're going to be able to achieve any goal that we set. You've probably heard this before, but if you believe it, you can achieve it. Well, to achieve anything, if you don't believe in it, you don't have a chance. So you've got to believe in it and have enthusiasm toward it to be able to get there. And other people's job is to support you to keep going in that direction. That's what we do here in Toastmasters. The third practice that we're going to focus on in the leadership challenge is to challenge the process. Be willing to see change as a good thing. How many of us have ever experienced change in an organization uh, or at home and people saw the change as a bad thing? Well, change is just change. The world is always changing. It's the law of entropy, that things are always moving from an organized space to something becoming disorganized. So if you wanna keep it organized, you've gotta work at it. You've gotta make changes to keep moving forward. So a great leader is always willing to see where the changes need to be made early on, being proactive and challenging the process because it's a good thing. Otherwise, if you just keep doing only the thing you've always done, it will eventually stop working and it could then create great problems. 
So you don't want to keep doing something just because it's working. You want to think, how can we improve on this process? So as a leader, great leaders always challenge the process. They see change management not as a bad thing, but as a good thing. So if you can make change a good thing for people, they're willing to work towards its success. So to challenge any process, we've always got to be able to see it, the positives, the benefits of that change. Why would it be a good thing for us to do this and to do it now? So let's look at how to do that. The first thing, if you're going to accept and manage change well, is you've got to acknowledge that change is necessary. So just like anywhere in life, if you stay in the same place all the time, life will pass you by. So if you want to move forward and change along with the changes in life, you've got to first acknowledge and accept the change is either happening or going to happen. And if you see that coming, you might want to plan for it, but you got to acknowledge it and accept it first. Most people, I will tell you, and you can think about this with anyone you've ever dealt with with change, is they want to fight change every step of the way. And yet, if you're willing to acknowledge and accept the change, you could be better positioned to be able to make a plan that will work well. The second step in accepting change is identify positive aspects of change. All change has positives and negatives to it. But if you focus on the positives of why it's a good thing, it keeps your energy, your enthusiasm moving towards supporting those choices that can help actually make that come to fruition. So identify the positive aspects of change so that you can see why you wanna to work toward that. If you see it as a negative, you're probably gonna fight it every step of the way. As a matter of fact, in a general population of everyone in your life, when it comes to change, 20% of people always see the positives. They tend to be very optimistic. 30% of people, tend to be pessimistic. They're always willing to see the worst of a situation and they can see it clearly. You probably know some people like that in your lives who tend to be a bit negative. That's a normal thing for us. But if you wanna be successful with change, know that 20% of people will, will support you. 30% is gonna not support you and 50% could go either way. So what we wanna to do to strategize is we want to get that 50% of people on our side if we're supporting this change. So we want to sell the benefits of this change, the positive things, to these neutral people. So you want the people who are your supporters to talk up the change. And you want to sort of squash the negativity that people are saying. And say, we'll put that aside for talking about later. As a matter of fact, sometimes I'll suggest you might get that 20% of people who support you and the 50% of people who could go either way in the same room and talk about this change in a very positive way and get them all moving forward into seeing this change as a good thing. Then you have what percentage of people supporting this change? 70%. Well, that's pretty good so far. But what about that other 30% who's going to want to drag it down? Well, you can get most of those 30% of people on your side, if you meet with them separately and you discuss the challenges. Now, they're going to be very vocal with you about what they see is going to be the problem with this change. They're going to be, you know, they see the negative part of it. They don't want this change. They want to fight this change. Well, fighting with them just creates more problems. So what we want to do instead is communicate with someone who doesn't agree with us in a way that makes them willing to listen and follow. How many of you would love to find a great way to get people who do not agree with you to listen to how you see it and be willing to follow you? There is a trick to that. And I'll teach you this method because this is probably the most powerful human communication tool you can use. This is your tip number three on how to get people to follow you. You must empathize first with your opponent, the people who disagrees with you. You must find a way to care about how they see it. Now, if you don't care how they see it, this is gonna be a little difficult for you. 
So one of the first things you're going to have to do is to come across like, I care how you see it. So I'm gonna show you how to do that. The first thing you wanna do is not say anything, just listen to them. Now you might ask questions and get them to open up, but listen actively where it looks like you're listening, you're paying attention, you're giving them eye contact, you're leaning in, you're nodding your head, you're agreeing with them. So listen to them in a way that where they believe you're truly listening. So that's the first part. The second, that's just as important, is they like to know that you acknowledged what they said, that you understood it. So you wanna verify your understanding. It's the only way in communication that you know that you were understood is that other person is gonna have to repeat back in their own words how they understood it. So in this case here, you're going to be the one listening and then acknowledge what you understood. So what I believe you're saying is this, and you want them to be able to sort of nod their head and say, yes, that's what I'm saying, so that they do know I was listening and I got it. This third part, which is the most important and sometimes the most difficult, is that when people believe they're right, what do they want you to do? When they think the way they see it is the right way, especially if they think yours is the wrong way, what would they prefer you do? They want you to agree with them. So this third step is to do just that. Find a way, after you've listened to them and you've acknowledged what you understood, find a way to validate how they see it. You might say something like, I can imagine with the way you're looking at this that I would probably come up with the same conclusion that you did. I certainly can see how you would see it that way. In other words, not only did I say that I got it, but I can see that that's, that's right. I get it. I can see how you could come up with that. People love to be validated. Then and only then should you bring up a different perspective, the one that you share. Well, I have a slightly different perspective and I was wondering if I might share that with you. So you're going to be asking them to listen. So you're modeling the way here for showing I do care how you see it, and now I would like you to care how I see it. The only time people are ever willing to listen to how you see it is if you're first willing to listen to how they see it. You always have to be the bigger person here to get what you want, which is I want them to listen to me. Well, the only way you can get them to listen to you is you've got to listen to them first, acknowledge what you understood, and then validate how they see it before you say anything about how you see it. Does everybody get that? That to me is the most powerful tool or trick you can use with other people to get the people who opposed you to be willing to consider your side of things. You got to consider their side first. So any questions about trick number three? So this, this is simple, but it's not necessarily easy. So it, but it does work with most people as long as you know, they're willing to, to, to work with you in some way. Now, there are some people who are just wanting to fight you and don't care how you see it. This isn't going to go well in that situation. You probably need, if you're a, the leader in a situation, you might have to use more authority over that situation. But generally... Most people will follow where you want them to go if they see what's in it for them. And here, if you demonstrate you care how they see it, they are more willing to care how you see it. So the summary here for challenging the process, encouraging others to embrace change as a good thing, is accept the fact that one third of people are gonna fight that change to start with. So be prepared for that, but first get the majority of people on your side sell them on the benefits of why this is a good thing before you address the people who don't think it's a good thing. Then when you want to address the people who want to fight you on it, make sure you listen to them first, acknowledge and then validate your opponents before you make your pitch to see if you can get them on board. This is the key to persuasion. And in Toastmasters, that's one of the most important leadership skills we work on is sometimes our job is to persuade people to follow. 
So, so keep in mind, it's, it's important to be able to follow this process because anyone can see the positivity, but sometimes looking in the mirror, we don't quite see that potential. But if we see it for others, we can help them to see it. But you first got to come from where they are first. The fourth area of leadership practices that Kuzes and Posner in the Leadership Challenge came up with is enabling others to act. Again, this is one of my favorites uh, because it's very difficult sometimes when I, when I um, give an assignment to someone, let's say I'm delegating to someone, how often do you ever delegate to someone else yet you don't trust they're going to do it in a way that's gonna get the results you want? Whether it's with adults or children, how can you let them come up with their own way? Well, you actually can, and it improves the overall relationship. So let's talk about what it is to empower people. Some of those maxims is that uh, uh, the key to delegation is empowering people. So when you delegate, you want to let them come up with their own way, because when they get to come up with their own way to get the results that we're going for, you're demonstrating you trust them. So keep in mind, it's all about that demonstration of trust. And if you want to be able to hold people, hold them accountable, people feel most accountable to the choices they make. So if you want them to own the choices, they have to own the process. So let them come up with their process. Now, you might want to guide them in a way toward what might be the best way, but it's their responsibility to explain the choice and how that choice is going to lead to get the results. So let's say if I'm delegating to somebody, I want them to get these results. If I let them come up with their way and they come up with a way and I'm thinking, I don't see how that's going to work. How do I trust that if I don't see how it's going to work? I cannot. But if I ask questions and say, could you explain to me how this choice is going to get those results? And they're either going to be able to do it or not do it. And of course, if they don't do it, we need to go negotiate something that's going to be more effective. But it's their job to explain to you how their way would get you the results. And once you see how their way would get the results, imagine it's probably so much easier then to um, be able to trust them when you see that how they're going to do it and how that's going to get the results we, that we uh, uh, were going for. So essentially, when you empower people, you always make sure it's the person who has the problem who should come up with the solutions. And if they have no idea at all how to come up with the solutions, you know, I say, I don't know how to solve this or how to achieve that. Don't tell them the solution because that's your solution for them. Offer them options. And keep in mind, it has to be at least three options. We can go through them and I'll show you why. Because if you tell someone, look, I'll give you one option. Obviously, that doesn't sound like a choice. If I say, I'll give you two options, you can either work with me or you can go somewhere else. That doesn't sound like a great option, a set of options. So you should always give people at least three options if they're not sure how to do something. And you can always guide them toward what option is going to be best, but it's got to be an option that they're willing to choose that would also work for me. So if I'm delegating, it's got to be a win-win solution, that it's got to work for both of us here, that the solution they choose would also work for me. So, and if we don't come up with something that does, maybe we should then brainstorm ideas, but then in the end, let them choose the plan because then who is responsible for their choice, for their plan? It makes it so much easier to hold people accountable when it's their plan. And then after they've chosen a plan for how they're gonna do something, of course, we need to follow through. So set up a support and accountability system so we can check to make sure that it's happening within the time frame that we agreed upon. Even that shouldn't be our choice as to when we're gonna check in with them. Who should come up with this solution as to how much support and when I should check in with them? Get them to come up with that. Because if they come up with it, they could never claim that you're micromanaging them because micromanaging is coming in and checking in them in a way that they're not comfortable with. That seems to sound like you don't trust them. But if we say, well, what would be the right amount of check-in for you? 
and they say, why don't you check in once a week here and I'll let you know where I am on this project at that point. If you follow their plan and it works well for you, it's, they're gonna, it's gonna work well for everybody. Everyone wins. So here the key in this particular way, this trick or tip number four, how to ensure successful delegation when you're leading others, always have them create the plan for how they're gonna get the results that we're going for. So once we're clear what the results are, have them create a plan, but make sure that you can support that plan. So it's gotta be a plan that they choose that you can see how that would work or else we have to, we have to talk further. So if their plan doesn't work well for you, it's not gonna work, work well for either of us. So always make sure that they come up with a plan that will work well for both. It's a win-win. And if it doesn't, then let's negotiate something that's gonna work well for both of us, as well as the follow-up plan for how we're going to check up on it to see how best to support them through the process of the plan. So negotiate a follow-up plan that also is a win-win for both. So you can delegate even to small children and have them come up with what they think is gonna be the best way to do it. It's just gotta be something you can agree to that's going to get the results. But if they come up with it, it makes it so much easier for you to hold them accountable than if you come up with the plan for them, because then if that's your plan and they don't put energy into it, they could certainly say when it fails, well, you can't blame me. You told me to do it that way. So you definitely wanna make sure they come up with the plan. So the summary here on this fourth step, enabling others to act is empower them to be accountable for their own choices. Ensure mutual clarity so that we're both clear what the result is. So I'm gonna discuss the result and you're gonna speak it back to me in such a way where I can agree, yes, that's what we're going for. Then I'm gonna have them come up with a plan of action. And only if they don't have a plan, might I give them a set of options. And if they offer a plan I cannot support, I'm going to ask for them to, um, to, you know, to discuss it, to explain it to me and negotiate a win-win that I can support, including that follow-up plan. And then our job is just enforce the plan. So we can delegate successfully to anyone. We just have to be both clear that we're going for the same result. They came up with the plan and we have a support plan for how I'm gonna check in that they're okay with that works well for them, that works well for me, and we follow that plan. That way they don't feel micromanaged. So enable others to act. This is one of my favorite tools to use to delegate well when I'm teaching management styles. And lastly, something that I said is not my strong suit, but it's something I can do, and this is encourage the heart. Make people feel valued for the efforts they make. So in Toastmasters, as well as other things, it's all about recognition. Recognize the efforts they make, even if they don't achieve to the level you're going for, if they're making an effort that's leading that direction, celebrate that. So they may not have done it perfectly, but they're making the effort to move in that direction. Celebrate that progress. So you want to demonstrate your care. And I underline demonstrate because it has to be communicated to them that they see that you care. That's what demonstrating means. You could say, I'm saying I care, but if they're not hearing it, you're not demonstrating it. So demonstrate you care, they get you care. Two, build relationships and trust. And through all those other exercises we just talked about, we're building those relationships and demonstrating we trust. And recognition is one of the best ways to build those relationships, letting people know that you appreciate the efforts they're making and support them in a positive way. And always engage people in the process. People love to be involved. So if you're gonna come up with a decision that's going to affect them, try your best to involve them in that decision-making process so they can be a part of it. When people feel involved, they're more willing to buy into it. So involve others. So here's a few things to know about when recognizing people. And this is what we spend a lot of time doing in Toastmasters because we give a lot of feedback to people, but we always wanna make sure that recognition sounds positive. So negative reinforcement is, is actually telling people what they should stop doing. Positive reinforcement is encouraging people to do more of something, 
showing people what they're doing right, what they should start doing. So the result is the same, whether I tell you to stop doing this or start doing this, I want this result, but people are more willing to listen to the positive, more willing to follow the positive. So learn how to communicate in positive ways. Recognize the little steps. Even in Toastmasters, we have these different levels of education so that when you finish the first level, we recognize that, we celebrate that, but you haven't finished this path of learning that you're working on. There's five levels to finish, but you work on your first one and you get recognized for that. Then you work on your second one, you get recognized for that. And each time during these pieces, there may be little sets of achievement that you can recognize that keep people moving forward. It's sort of looking at the difference between the two types of, of uh, reward, intrinsic reward or in reinforcement or extrinsic. Intrinsic is the things that just make you feel good inside, those warm, fuzzy feelings. I can't make you feel good, but I can say things and do things that can demonstrate I value you and your efforts that can trigger those feelings inside. Those actually have more powerful impact on people than the extrinsic, like when I give you an award. But for some people, they love awards, recognition. Let me give you this plaque. Let me give you, you get this pin set for achieving this. You get, a, you get to wear a little pin that says, I've achieved this level. Some people love that. And everyone is different. So if you want to find the perfect thing that motivates people, you've got to help them by finding their carrot. What is that carrot that you can dangle in front of somebody that makes them want to go for that? What do you use to dangle in front of somebody to motivate them? It's different for everybody. So you've got to get to know people and find out what their carrots are. And of course, you want to make sure whatever that is that motivates them, it's something that's within your power to give people. If someone says, well, the only motivation for me is give me a million dollars. Well, that's a motivation for many people, but that's not within our power to do. So it's got to be a carrot that you can actually offer. So here is tip number five, the last and perhaps what I think is the most powerful tip of all. When you, when you motivate people, it's that intrinsic feeling that has the biggest, the biggest motivator. And praise is perhaps the most powerful way to make people want to do more of something. When they know you appreciate the effort they make, they're willing to do more. And if it sounds authentic when you deliver the praise, and if the impact is one of surprise, they didn't expect you to say this, they didn't expect you to do this right now, and you catch them out of the blue, and you praise them for something they did. So whether it's a small child, someone on your team, it could be your spouse, it could be anyone. And the first step is think of something that they have done that you can praise them for, a specific action, and then out of the blue, unexpectedly, get their attention and thank them. So I might say, hey, do you have a second? I wanted to talk to you about something. And they go, uh, yeah, what is it? I say, hey, I just want to let you know, I really appreciate that you did. And then it's this specific thing. So I won't say something general. Like if I said, you did a great job at, well, how do I repeat great job? That's not specific. What was it that I did that you thought was great? Be very specific. That's what we learn to do in Toastmasters when we're given evaluations that are uh, meant to be very motivating. It should be very specific what you're giving information about. Always demonstrate the value of that action to either you or the organization. In other words, it's great that they did this and here's why it was great. Here's why I appreciate the fact that you did this. And then encourage them to do more of it and then walk away in the conversation. You wanna leave them a bit in a state of shock. It's a one-way conversation that you have with somebody where you thank them for something that they didn't expect, some little thing, but it's something you appreciate they did. Then they will do more of those little things. And it's the little things that add up. So demonstrate to them that you appreciate out of the blue, hey, I wanted you to let you know, I really appreciate that Let's say, for instance, someone comes late to your meetings a lot and you had a discussion with them and said, actually, it'd probably be better if you got to the meetings maybe five minutes early. And this next time at the meeting, they were there a few minutes early. 
Now, not right now, although you can say, hey, great, I'm glad you got on the call. Uh, but then maybe later on, the next day even, you call them out of the blue and it's a one-on-one. -on -one. I'm not going to say this in front of other people because some people come early to the meeting all the time. But I'm going to call, pull them aside, maybe even just call them on the phone and say, hey, Tammy, do you have a second? I just want to talk to you for a second. And she's like, yeah, what is it? Uh, oh, I, I just want to let you know, I really appreciate you working with me and coming to, I know she got to the meeting like five minutes early and really appreciate it. It helps us to know who's going to be here at the meetings on time and make sure we've got all the roles filled. So that was very helpful. And I just want to know, I, I just say, I just want you to know, I appreciate it. And I encourage you to just keep that up. Thanks. And then basically I'm going to get off the phone. Yeah, well, I got to go. You have a great day. And I want to leave them sort of hanging up the phone a little bit in shock, a little bit surprised, because it'll stay with them. It has impact. People love it when you notice the little tiny things they do and you let them know when they don't expect it. So right after they do it, you should always say thank you, but they're expecting that. But later catch them off guard and remind them of the thing they did and how much you appreciated that and then move on. So this is probably one of the most powerful ways to acknowledge people and make them feel valued. So essentially, these are five of the tips in the five different practices that great leaders follow. So if you model the way for other people, always be the one to be the most responsible, be the one to, to, to step up first. If you want other people to do it, you've got to model that way for others. You inspire people with a vision that makes them so excited about it, it becomes their vision. They're willing to do it because they're excited about it. Always be willing to challenge the process. I know we're doing this and this works well, but everything changes so that how do we keep this up? What, what changes do we need to make that's going to keep our success going? Because if we just keep doing this, we'll eventually not be so successful anymore. So challenge the process and accept some changes. Enable others to come up with their own way to take action because they're more willing to take responsibility when it's their choice. So make it their choice, or at least come up with options and let them choose. And lastly, encourage the heart. Make people know how much you appreciate the efforts they make, and they will make more efforts. If you want people to become more uh, dedicated to your club, be more willing to step up, and be more willing to stay with the program and do the work it takes to be successful, you've got to make sure you appreciate the efforts they're making and they see that. So this is the key to being a powerful leader. And I just want to see if there's any questions that we've got out there while we've got a few minutes. Uh, you can unmute yourself and we'll take a few questions. Anybody have any questions at all? Yeah, Bart, I want to I want to know how you came up with this, you know, well-rounded and full and comprehensive presentation. Well, I've been teaching leadership skills for about 25 years, and I'm always looking for what works and being aware of what doesn't work, <laughs> because, because sometimes we learn as leaders by taking a chance, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And I thought, well, what could I tell people that's simple? So usually in three steps, you know, even though it can be complicated, generally you can boil it down to what are three things that makes it easy to, to remember. And so I use the model of the five tips in Kuzas and Posner's book, which is one of my favorites, The Leadership Challenge. I love that book that teaches you about these five areas and how to master them in many, many different ways. But then I thought, what is the most powerful way in each of these areas that if you practice this, you will get results? And so I thought, well, well I can come up with something that's a one-hour presentation that takes what I would normally teach maybe in a whole day and let you guys practice and do some exercises. Obviously, this is more a one-way presentation, though if we had more time, a few hours, I'd then give you guys examples, let you practice, see what works and what doesn't work. But it's just what works for most people. Now, I will say if you've got people who are uh, you know, uh, psychotic, let's say, that's just not going to work for them. I, you know, people who, uh, you know, have emotional issues, sometimes this doesn't work so clearly. But for the average person, every one of these tips work most every time. Other questions? And I am willing to send this out to people. If you want a copy of this, I'm willing to send that to you. So just let me know. They can get in touch with, uh, well, you guys can let them know who to get in touch with and 
then uh, they can get in touch with me. Angie knows how to reach me as well. Bart, so, but, can I ask you a question, please? Of you course. Leave? Oh, yes. Um, I have a question regarding a person who's late in the meeting. So how would you encourage that person to come on time? Please. Okay. Well, first of all, one thing is, do they see the value of that? Because there's always a reason why people do something. So they're not putting it at the top of their priorities. And so letting them know the value of it is helpful. So I said, hey, I was wondering if I could talk to you about something. And they're like, yeah, what is it? And it's like, because these can be difficult conversations. But then I say, hey, I, I noticed that um, more times than not, you tend to be getting to the meetings right when we're starting or sometimes just afterwards. And it makes it sometimes difficult to fill roles that might need to be filled beforehand. I, I would love to try to encourage all of our members. So in other words, I'm not just expecting it of them, but I really would like everybody to make an effort to be on the call at least five minutes early, if not 10 minutes early, because sometimes before our meetings, we need to adjust the agenda. We need to know that everyone's going to be here because if you said you were going to play a role and you're not here when the meeting starts, we're going to try to put someone else in that role. And if they show up late and then want to play that role, we've already assigned it to someone else. And I don't want to have either party be in that level of discomfort of having to take something away or let them know they were too late for that. So I just want to ask the favor because it is their choice. So I was wondering if I could ask a favor, if you could uh, make an effort to get to the meetings about five to 10 minutes early. That would be ideal for us. Would that work for you? And they might say, um, you know, well, no, that doesn't work for me for this reason. And I said, well, what can we do to support that? What can we do to help? Sometimes people just forget about the meetings or they're doing so many other things that they don't manage their time well. Perhaps setting an alarm for 10 minutes before the meeting. So when that goes off, that's, that's telling me, stop what I'm doing and in the next minute or so, get on the call. So there are different ways in which people can do it, but let them come up with what's gonna be the best way that they would get themselves to the meeting on time. Because you can give them options for how they can get to the meeting on time, but only they know the options that they'd be most willing to choose. You just want them to choose something that's going to work at getting to the meeting on time. And if you had talked about this as something to everyone in the meeting, so have this as a discussion overall in the meeting. Hey, I noticed that sometimes we're not all getting to the meetings on time, so I'm not pointing out any individuals. Sometimes we're not getting here, and I wondered if we could make a commitment to each other to get to the call, get on the call uh, five or ten minutes early. We really need that to make this happen for the meeting, and here's why. And see if you can get a commitment. And once you get people to commit, all you're going to be doing after that is holding them accountable for what they agreed to. It's about their integrity. And so I might say, hey, I realized at the meeting we talked about this and agreed we were going to get here on time or actually five minutes early. And I was wondering what might be getting in your way. So I'm going to just ask them to figure out, you know, do you notice it? Do you own it? And are you willing to fix it? And you let them come up with their own way to fix it, empower them to come up with that. But they have to be willing to notice it, that they're not getting there on time own the fact that they're the ones making choices. Other people are not keeping them from getting to the meeting on time, only they are. And they need to come up with a way that's gonna fix their problem. Thank you. Thank you. Sure, thank you all. I appreciate the opportunity. Part of Hi, Bruce. Can I make a comment? Yeah. Uh, I appreciate your talk, it was really, um, very informative, really well organized, uh, very interesting. Uh, a lot of good points that you had to make. Do you go out and give any of, like, do you go to business people and give them advice? Like when you say you've been in leadership for, I don't know, 20 years or whatever, um, how does that manifest itself? And then mm -hmm. how would you evaluate like polit the political scene right now and the leadership you see going on? Okay. Uh, well, the first one is that uh, as a corporate trainer and professional coach, I usually like to go in and teach these lessons to, to teams and then come in and coach them on the lessons because it takes a little bit of time to practice this to see how it works. Uh, and that, and that we didn't have time to practice here, but, but that, that's something that I would 
uh, generally do when I'm working with my corporate clients is I would say, well, let's come in and I'm going to teach them some of these tips and then I'm going to show them how to use it and then encourage them to practice it. And then we'll come back about a month or so later after they've had some time to practice the skill and tell me how's it been going, what's working, what's not. Let me hear how it's going and then we'll, we'll adjust it and give them more time to practice so that they can build it into a skill. I think the biggest problem we have today is that we're not we're more focused on our differences than on what we want together. And that's one of the biggest problems we have is that it seems that, uh, that people are not so willing anymore to find common ground. It's like, we wanna live in a culture where we're all very different, men, women, people of different ages, different nationalities, I and mean, we're all Americans living in this country, but we have different beliefs, different, different ways we do things, different uh, experiences. And yet, are we willing to respect other people's experiences? And it seems like we're losing that, that uh, it seems like today people don't think they have to respect someone else's opinion. And I think that's what, what's really changed is probably um, the media uh, in terms of uh, uh, the social media, that people now use social media as their way of garnering attention and opinions but generally people are just looking on social media for other people who agree with them and to essentially use that as their power to say, so all these people agree with me, we don't agree with you, we don't have to listen to you. As if someone who might be in the mi minority doesn't have a valid point. And that makes it almost impossible to get along. It's only gonna create battling between people until we learn to start actually talking to each other and be willing to listen to each other because that's the problem is there seems to be no listening anymore. It's all about the talking and people are talking at us and no one is listening. So that's the biggest problem I see. Hey, uh, hey Bart, uh, thank yeah, you Chris. so much for the speech. Uh, it was very informative and enlightening. Um, and, um, you know, was, uh, you hit on a lot of like interesting key points, especially like the, like the encourage the heart part. That was, that was really cool. Uh, um, so yeah, I just wanted to say thanks for sharing the speech. It was really cool. Yeah. Oh, thank you. This, this is actually a complicated lot of information that's simplified. So yeah. I mean, I'm going to break this down into three simple steps. That way, at least you can remember the three steps to achieve this goal. For but sure. You know, this is all about human nature. And that's, uh, as we were talking about earlier, it's very natural for humans not to want to validate other people. I said, that's the hardest thing there is to do is to have someone who has a completely different view of yours and, and try to validate that. And yet there are reasons why they came up with that opinion based on this, 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 and this. Well, if I was in that culture or had that background and those beliefs, I probably would come up with the same conclusion but I don't come from that culture. I don't have those beliefs. I have very different beliefs and such. And in our culture in America, as with almost anywhere in the world today, we're a global society, learning how to respect big differences in how to do something is key to being able to get along without trying to kill each other. It has never gone well to just kill people who don't agree with you. You know, that'll just end up with once, because you never kill them all. And then those that survive want to kill all the other people who attack them. And it just goes back and forth, back and forth for centuries. And that's what's been going on forever without people just learning how to get along and accept the differences and that everybody has the right way. I'll ask you one thing as we leave this idea, which is how many of us ever drive with somebody else in the car and the other person in the car wants to make how we're driving wrong? <laughs> It's like, it's, it'll still get us there. It's just a different way of driving. And if they're the ones driving, let go. I mean, as, as long as your life is not at risk, you know, let them drive the way they want to drive and don't say anything. And if you're driving, they shouldn't have the right to say anything either, you know, uh, unless it's something positive, some positive, constructive uh, feedback. And that's where I'll leave things at. So thank you all for your time. <laughs> Hey, thank you, Bart. Thanks for 